All right, welcome back everybody. We're gonna get started. We're gonna try to keep on time a little bit. We got, we got a late start this morning. Um, I promise you that if we all get seated, we'll still be able to keep our full lunch so you can have all of these conversations during lunch. I'm really glad that everybody is finding lots of different issues to discuss with one another. Um, before I introduce our next speaker, um, there were a couple questions that came up during the break about who is in the room. Um, and so I just wanted to quickly address that. Um, we have about 150 people that registered for this workshop. Um, I think we lost about 30. We're hoping they'll still come through and come in um, later. But of that, about um, 120 of you came from the general public, as in not a student here. Um, and of those that came from the general public, we had a really good distribution of um, state and local government. Uh, we had about 30 attorneys, or at least people who were willing to tell us they were attorneys, um, and about 20 certified floodplain managers. Um, during our breakout groups, there will be the opportunity to share who you are and some of the issues that you're facing, so hopefully you'll be able to have some of those conversations about um, getting to know each other during lunch and then during the breakout sessions. Um, but now we're going to hear about some of the legal issues from recent hurricane seasons and increasing risks of flooding. Dina Adler is a climate law fellow at the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law at Columbia Law School. Dina's work at the Sabin Center includes tracking U.S. and international trends in climate change litigation and developing legal and regulatory tools to advance the efforts of governments and private actors to adapt to changing climate and to mitigate the effects of climate change. Dina has her JD from Yale Law School and a Master's of Environmental Management at Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, thank you, Julia, for having me here. Um, as Julia mentioned, I'm Dean Adler. I'm a climate law fellow at the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law at Columbia Law School. And I'm going to be using the recent hurricane seasons and flooding from those hurricanes as a little bit of a lens for thinking about some of these issues. They certainly um, bring a, paint a stark picture of some of the risks of flooding. But what I'm going to talk about in terms of uh, litigation and policy solutions by no means are limited to flooding caused by hurricanes. So I'm hoping to pivot gears a little bit from the um, great remarks from Deanna and Elena on the potential liability of local and state governments. Um, so if you're local state folks in the room, I'm not, not going after how, how you might be responsible now. I want to start thinking about how the private actors who own some of these facilities might be uh, put on the hook and be responsible to adapt their facilities. And some of these theories, um, they may not even be trends yet. They're kind of novel, they're um, nascent, uh, they're some food for thought for the law students who are in the room, but I'm also, since a lot of these um, legal theories um, may not yet be ripe, may not bear fruit, um, we're going to talk about how local and state actors um, can use policy solutions to fill the gaps. Um, and then the second half of my presentation, I'm going to transition to specifically um, look at some local and state opportunities to help the National uh, Flood Insurance Program, which as many people in the room know probably needs a lot of help, but maybe look at some uh, piecemeal places where we can help it work better in the face of climate change. Um, and I know there's a, a wide variety of folks in the room, so I'll try to touch on these issues in a way that uh, appeals to different levels of background. And I'm gonna cover a lot of ground. It's more of a survey, um, but maybe when we're dealing with flooding, it pays to be shallow rather than deep, right? Um, so uh, launching right in, I don't think it shocks anyone in this room that extreme weather is extremely costly. Um, we already uh, touched on this figure earlier this morning, but in 2017, the U.S. experienced a historic 16 weather and climate disasters that cost over a billion dollars each, cumulatively costing more than $300 billion. And half of those events um, were related to hurricanes, flooding, um, or other extreme weather. And digging specifically into the hurricane um, aspect, the top of the top five costliest U.S. hurricanes on record, we had three in 2017 that cumulatively cost $265 uh, billion in damages. Um, Florence this year, on the projections I saw from Moody's, I don't know if they've been updated, but we're thinking that uh, the cost would be between 38 and 50 um, billion. So 
seeing mounting costs recently from these hurricanes. And those costs, um, of course, are not just economic. Um, I'm inundating you with the requisite inundation photos um, for one of these presentations. Um, here are some images from Hurricane Harvey. Um, we're talking about um, the emotional costs of people losing their homes, um, environmental and human health costs as we look at the flooding of uh, Superfund sites, um, the leaking of sewage, the um, unpermitted air pollution. There were, I believe, uh, 8.3 million pounds of unpermitted air pollution reported after Harvey because of the shutdown, the unexpected shutdown startup and malfunction of various facilities. And obviously, the, um, that area that Hurricane Harvey hit is a real hotbed of those types of facilities. But uh, air pollution is maybe not the first um, type of pollution we think about um, when we think of flooding. Um, but in thinking about this wide variety of potential uh, impacts, it helps us think about what the maybe legal hooks might be in order to help make sure that these facilities prepare themselves for flooding. Um, so we already had a nice rundown of the science, but just to reiterate, we are uh, brewing a perfect storm, literally and figuratively, um, for these problems as we think about um, the increasing uh, risk from the expected intensity of uh, tropical cyclones, um, sea level rise of one to four feet by the end of the century, and as much as eight feet, um, and of course, uh, more frequent and intense extreme precipitation events. So I'm going to break my talk down into uh, two buckets of solution as we start trying to uh, bail water a little bit on these problems. And so as I mentioned, the, the first bucket is going to be these sort of emerging and potential litigation avenues against private actors. And I'm focusing a bit on energy related um, infrastructure. We'll hear more about uh, other types of infrastructure uh, later this morning. And I admit I'm not touching on some of the really big um, suits that you probably have seen in the mainstream media um, against fossil fuel companies by around a dozen municipalities and the state of Rhode Island now seeking um, to get those fossil fuel companies on the hook um, for paying for adaptation costs. Um, I'm really digging into the kind of like nascent um, theories that I think aren't getting as much press to kind of help us think through where we might be going in this space. And then the second half of my talk, I will be discussing um, some updates for the National uh, Flood Insurance Program, as I mentioned, with an emphasis on local and state um, innovations. So diving right into bucket one, um, I'm going to survey kind of four potential issues. I'm going to talk about Hurricane Harvey and some recent negligence and criminal suits against the Arkema chemical plant and the explosions that happened there. Um, then I'm going to uh, go over to talk about some Conservation Law Foundation litigation that was filed against Exxon and Shell in regards to petroleum products storage and distribution facilities that are attempting to get those facilities to um, on the hook prior to any kind of um, large leakage event, more of a, a failure to adapt before the disaster litigation suit. Um, then we're going to jump over to the National Environmental Policy Act and uh, how environmental review can potentially create an opportunity for litigation, and then briefly touch on rate-making petitions as an opportunity to get public utility um, service commissions to force utilities to understand and prepare for climate change impacts. So I'm going to have to keep us moving at a clip. Um, but this um, map, just to kind of set the context for these Hurricane Harvey suits, um, shows the distribution of energy and industrial infrastructure um, that was exposed to floodwaters from Hurricane Harvey. And as you can see, highly concentrated in that area. Um, and this is a particular hotbed. Um, and the Arkema chemical plant, um, which some of you probably saw the headlines after it exploded, um, it lost electricity, its backup generators failed, it was refrigerating highly volatile chemicals, which then exploded um, and released really noxious fumes that made first responders really ill and residents, and they had to evacuate within a mile and a half of the facility. And subsequently, um, Harris County and the state of Texas um, sued the plant. Um, there have been a number of lawsuits filed. Um, first, I'm going to mention this civil lawsuit that they filed, which alleged violations under the Texas Clean Air Act, the Texas Water Code, and the Harris County floodplain uh, regulations. And what's notable about this case is kind of seeing this transition of the state 
um, thinking about suing, or not thinking about suing, um, the company for um, risks they should have known about, not uh, risks that they had previously experienced. So a lot of the preparation for flooding at the facility were based on what had been historically experienced. And so uh, we started, uh, Lena and Deanna started talking a little bit about the questions of what is foreseeable, which is, you know, for the lawyers and law students in the room, a, a big question um, in the law and how that is changing. So I think following the suit um, could be very interesting um, for teasing that out. Um, there are also suits filed by the first responders and that were injured in the grave suit and the residents as well. And those were under several theories of negligence. Um, and then there are also some criminal um, suits that have been filed against Arkema and its CEOs, and um, they were indicted uh, in August. So all this litigation is still um, pending, and it's hard to tease out exactly what the results will be now, but it's certainly putting these facilities on notice of how foreseeability is shifting, what's constituted as reckless behavior um, in light of what knowledge these uh, facilities had is changing. Um, so jumping a little gears, uh, and I know that we have some friends from the Conservation Law Foundation in the room, so they can feel free to, to pipe in if there's anything they want to add to my summary of their uh, organization's cases. Um, but the Conservation Law Foundation um, filed uh, two suits, one against Exxon, one against Shell in recent years for failure to adapt their facilities and alleged violations of the Clean Water Act and the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. And these cases argued that in light of what these companies knew about climate change and the risks of climate change, um, there is more that they can do to prepare their facilities in terms of um, the planning and preparation and like updates that they have to do to the facilities to deal with um, surge and flooding. And you can see in um, the map on the screen the vulnerability of the Everett Terminal in Massachusetts, which um, was the subject of the first lawsuit fired against Exxon um, in 2016, and that facility's vulnerability um, to surge during a hurricane event. And in this case, there were 14 um, claims filed under the Clean Water Act and one under the um, Resource Conservation Recovery Act. Um, the second case filed against Shell in regard to their uh, Providence uh, facilities, um, again, is vulnerable to um, surge as you can, during a hurricane event, as you can see on the map. And in both of these cases, um, I should have noted, we're talking about facilities that um, store and distribute petroleum products. Um, here we're up to, right now, 20 um, Clean Water Act uh, claims, and currently one um, claim under RICRA, but there's a proposed second amendment, amended complaint um, that CLF is waiting for uh, leave to file um, that would add another um, RICRA claim there that is very interesting. and. Um, be particularly interesting to see what the courts do with that. Um, so just touching um, briefly on these claims, um, uh, under the Clean Water Act, as you know, many folks in this room know, um, regulated point sources can't discharge um, pollutants to a water of the US um, without having the appropriate permits, the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, um, NIPTES permits, or the state level equi uh, equivalent, uh, RIPTES in Rhode Island, um, are needed for industrial facilities of this nature. And these permits you know, regulate the discharge of industrial wastewater, process water, and the storm water um, that comes off of these facilities. And these alleged violations um, do include um, numeric effluent a limit of uh, violations, but they're also much broader than that, right? They're operational requirements. They're planning requirements to um, prevent stormwater runoff and prevent spill pre and do spill prevention. They're monitoring, reporting, informational requirements. Um, they're failures to amend and update. Um, so lots of different ways where we're thinking about how these facility owners could be on the hook um, based on what they know before you actually have these leaks happening, which is really optimal for everyone's well-being. Um, and then, of course, the Resource Conservation and Recovery Acts um, add in this hook um, for the uh, treatment and handling, storage, transportation of potentially hazardous waste. Um, and the, the language there that's really important is that it poses an eminent and substantial endangerment to health or the environment. Um, and the uh, new um, 
the second amended complaint that they're hoping to file um, touches into what might be the case for a large generator of hazardous waste, additional um, requirements that they may have to make sure they operate their facility in a way that um, prevents a sudden or non-sudden release of these discharges. So where are we in these cases? Um, in the Exxon case, which was filed first, um, we heard from the court um, last September in 2017, um, the US District Court of Massachusetts uh, made a decision on standing and ruled that Conservation Law Foundation did have standing for present and eminent injuries to its members' aesthetic and recreational interests in the Mystic River. Um, but it said they did not have standing for injuries that allegedly will result from rises in sea level, increases in the severity and frequency of storms and flooding that will occur in the far future, such as in 2050 or 2100. Um, so mixed bag. Why is it particularly interesting um, or concerning that they've made this, the courts made this split, um, regardless of uh, what the, the, the jurisdictional uh, logic is in terms of preparing for climate change impacts. Um, well, sorry, I should rewind for a second. The court's logic here that they wouldn't assess these uh, future impacts is that NIPTI's permits have to be updated at least every five years. So you couldn't make a ruling based on what would happen beyond those five years because the permits could be updated, and thus um, you wouldn't have these problems and violations. Um, so the reason, um, going back, that that would be concerning um, is the idea of permit shields. So under the Clean Water Act, um, NIPTI's permit holders are largely shielded from liability for their discharges as long as they're in compliance with their permits. So now we're finding ourselves potentially in a scenario where if these permits and the requirements are not updated to reflect um, rising risks of climate change, but are just being um, based on historic flooding events, that you're going to basically provide a shield that lets the owners of these facilities um, avoid needing to update um, their planning and um, conformance with good engineering practices. So that if this is how the, the case goes forward, it really highlights the importance um, of finding a way to update um, these NIPTES permit requirements and the state water quality standards um, that when those are updated, they trigger needing to update um, the NIPTES permit requirements in order to bring to make sure that those state water quality goals are met. And I know um, Elena and the Q&A kind of set us up for this a little bit, talking about the importance of maybe even having um, Cla reopener clauses to update these permits sooner than when they renew. Um, and really, larger than even the reopener clause issue is the fact that just so many of these permits are administratively renewed without um, being uh, reconsidered. Um, and I mean, that's probably a limitation of government resources, but this litigation kind of highlights the need to dig in there. Uh, so the, the third thing I'd like to talk about in bucket one um, is environmental review and the National Environmental uh, Policy Act, um, which um, requires federal agencies who are undertaking actions that significantly affect the environment to do a review of those effects on the environment um, and the adverse consequences, possible alternatives. And the courts have been trying to tease out um, what exactly that means for consideration of climate change. And in 2016, the Council on Environmental Quality and the Executive Office of the President um, attempted to try to clarify um, what these uh, requirements should be with some guidance. And that offered guidance on how we should consider both greenhouse gas emissions that would be um, emitted in relation to these uh, projects, and also how we should consider the effect of climate change impacts on projects during environmental review. Um, this guidance was withdrawn by the Trump administration in 2017, um, but the withdrawal made very clear that it did not walk back any existing law on which the guidance was based, and the guidance very much was meant to um, clarify existing law, not create new law. Um, so we're left um, with the state of current case law. I'm not going to dig into each of these cases in detail, but I put up these citations um, so that you can see evidence that there are multiple courts that have already found that considering climate change is definitely a part of environmental review. Um, the question is what does an adequate consideration of climate change look like? 
So how could this potentially be interesting for um, facilities that handle um, petroleum products um, and energy infrastructure, fossil uh, fuel um, related infrastructure? Well, under the Natural Gas Act, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is responsible for um, environmental review of facilities that are related to natural gas, um, including LNG facilities, which we're seeing a lot of popping up along the coast in recent years. Um, they have released guidance that says that as part of your environmental review, you have to consider um, flooding and hurricanes and sea level rise due to climate change. Um, so the Sabin Center is engaged in um, submitting public comments and uh, making sure to drive home that these duties exist. Um, there have been a couple of FERC orders um, where there have been you know, administrative proceedings um, raising the question of whether a couple of facilities have adequately um, considered sea level rise. It's just been not, I mean, more than a footnote, but it's really just touched on these issues uh, very briefly. So far, it's found that consideration of sea level rise has been adequate. Um, but that's largely been a question of these facilities, the fact that the review was adequate in these instances um, doesn't mean that there couldn't be a future facility that doesn't do it adequately. And what's interesting of thinking about this as a future um, litigation hook is the idea that it would be done, that this environmental review is conducted up front um, before um, the facility even goes through to completion. But then there's also on the back end um, this potential uh, litigation hook if they fail. Because uh, after the administrative proceedings, you could appeal it to the courts. Um, again, flagging state level opportunities. Um, there are state and municipal um, environmental review requirements, and that's a place where consideration of climate change can be integrated as well. Um, we have a paper up on the Sabin Center website by an attorney at our center, Jessica Wentz, um, that discusses um, some of the ways this has been done at the state and local level, um, available at that link. Um, so you can check that out uh, via these slides later if that is something of interest to you. Um, the fourth um, prong that I'm considering in this bucket is how do we um, work with a state public service commissions, and I'm going to use a case study from uh, New York City um, following Superstorm Sandy, um, in which we lost um, electricity um, in in large areas, but as someone who was born and raised in Manhattan, the fact that we lost electricity in Manhattan was particularly shocking. We just don't expect that. Um, and following Superstorm Sandy, the Sabin Center was involved with others to file a petition that would require, that the Public Service Commission require utilities to prepare and implement plans to address climate change impacts. Um, this resulted in a final order and settlement with Con Edison to implement some of these state-of-the-art measures to uh, plan for and prepare its electric gas and steam systems for impacts of climate change and the formation of a storm hardening and resiliency collaborative to figure out how to invest um, a proposed $1 billion in funds to undertake um, these activities. It's, it's a really interesting story. We were ho I think the center was hoping that um, more uh, states and uh, municipalities would follow the lead and work with other public service um, commissions to advance this effort. Um, we've also hit some roadblocks. The reporting has been somewhat delayed, but these reports are coming out, have been started coming out chapter by chapter um, this year, and we sit in on these stakeholder meetings and we're making sure that the chapters keep coming out um, and that as they come out, the actual recommendations will be implemented um, into um, action on the ground, and we will file subsequent rate-making petitions as needed to make sure that that happens. Um, so uh, shifting gears a little bit um, to a second bucket of solutions, so kind of wrapping up how do we use litigation to kind of uh, prod um, liability for private actors, um, and how do we avoid getting some of that na nasty chemicals that are being dumped into the air and water from being dumped in the first place. Um, now thinking about uh, another angle on the risks of flooding and the risks to um, homeowners and thinking about how to um, update the national or fill gaps in the national flood insurance uh, program. So we've been, the Sabin Center's been working with the Natural Resources Defense Council over the past year on a couple of proposals, um, a discounts for buyouts proposal, um, the adoption of more robust substantial damage and improvement standards, and the promotion of state level flood risk disclosure laws. Um, 
So I'll jump into each of those in a little more detail, um, but just a first a quick overview of the National Flood Insurance Program, or NFIP, because um, I know that there's folks with a variety of backgrounds in the room. Um, the NFIP was established by the National Flood Insurance Act of 1968, um, amended and modified by subsequent acts of Congress, and it provides federally backed flood insurance protection for homeowners and renters and communities that have entered the program. And to enter the program, communities have to adopt um, regulations that ensure smarter development within the floodplains. Uh, so these include building and zoning code requirements um, and the adoption of flood insurance rate maps which you know show the risk level of flood hazard across an area um, including special flood hazard areas which are these areas in the hundred year floodplain um, which we've already talked about having a one percent chance of flooding in a given year um, and noting these special flood hazard, hazard areas is especially meaningful to make sure that we're uh, touching this is where a lot of the regulations kick in even though there are plenty of homes that are at risk that are outside of this Plain, floodplain, as we've mentioned, um, it's not as extensive as it would really need to be in order to make sure folks are protected. Um, so anyone who's familiar with the NFIP knows that it um, has some problems. Uh, to give it, to be fair, it has been, um, it has issued 5.5 million low-cost flood insurance policies, and that's for those policies are located in 22,000 communities in all 50 states. So it's trying to do a lot. Um, but as of July 2018, it had racked up $20.5 billion in debt, and that includes $16 billion already forgiven by Congress um, in October 2017. And as you can see from the bar chart on the screen, um, the font might be a little small there, um, a lot of this debt is associated with hurricanes um, and other extreme uh, flooding events. So we see this big uptick in the debt um, a majority of the debt um, after 2005 when we had hurricanes Katrina, Rita, um, and Wilma. And then we see another jump after 2012, after Superstorm Sandy, and then a smaller jump um, after 2016 with Louisiana flooding and Hurricane Matthew. Um, so thinking about how to deal with hurricanes is definitely at the forefront of this issue. Um, folks are probably familiar with the fact that there was a, uh, the Bigger Waters Flood Insurance Reform Act of 2012 that tried to restore some fiscal soundness to the program by having premiums more reflective of risk rather than being um, so subsidized. Um, but you know, important sections of that were repealed by the Homeowner Flood Insurance Affordability Act of 2014. Um, so one of the key challenges um, that could use reform within the NFIP is the issue of severe repetitive lost properties. Um, so these are homes that are caught in the cycle of flood, build, repeat. Um, you can see on this map, um, hopefully it looks a little darker from the angle you guys are seeing it, um, that a lot of these um, homes are located um, along the coast, but that they are certainly not exclusive to the coast. Um, and these uh, homes, the rebuilding of them, not only is that emotionally traumatic to keep having to rebuild your home, um, but it's eating up a lot of taxpayer dollars um, that maybe could be spent in other ways to help reduce the risks these homeowners face. Um, the, the NFIP has paid $5.5 billion to repair and rebuild um, 30,000 of these uh, severe repetitive loss properties between 1978 and 2015. And though these properties are only 0.5% of those insured through the program, they represent 9.6% of all damages paid out. Um, so that's a real red flag of a place where we can maybe make a difference in some of the debts of the program. And the program in general is of course in danger because of climate change, but so in particular is the growing, we could have a growing number of these severe repetitive loss properties. So more generally, climate change and sea level rise um, are a problem for the NFIP because um, we're gonna have the expansion of um, special flood hazard areas in this 100 year floodplain, um, which could grow between 40 and 45% by 2100. Um, so that's increasing the number of people who would seek policies, the average loss cost per policy, which again drives up this problem of needing um, premiums that are even higher to cover the higher damage costs. And then additionally, if this issue of severe repetitive loss properties, um, the NRDC has an issue brief um, that's also linked to on the slide that an additional three feet of sea level rise by 2100 could result in an additional 820,000 of these severe repetitive loss properties and six feet of sea level rise would result in 2.57 million more. Um, 
of these severe repetitive loss properties. So dealing with these properties would be um, probably more than a drop in the bucket of handling FEMA's uh, and the NFIP's problems, even if it's not um, a, a, sa a save-all solution. Um, so the first um, proposal that I'm going to discuss is this discounts for buyouts proposal. So the idea here would be to offer qualifying homeowners a guarantee of a future buyout as a benefit of their flood insurance coverage. Um, keyword being future. Um, as FEMA currently does buyouts, you offer it after the home has been damaged by a flood event. Um, and the idea to get folks to take this deal would be you could reduce the flood insurance premium as an incentive uh, for them. And it would be a voluntary uh, program fund funded by FEMA, administered by states, um, who would be you know, responsible for overseeing the actual purchase of the home and the demolition after a disaster struck. And this is not meant to replace um, the current um, buyout program by FEMA, um, but it's meant to supplement it. And it fills some key gaps, right? It discourages the long lag time that usually occurs after a buyout. Usually someone's home is damaged and, you just, and that's when the clock starts ticking to try to create this buyout transaction. It can take years. And meanwhile, this person has nowhere to live um, they have high bills to either repair the home or go somewhere else, and they don't have the money um, to go somewhere else to take the buyout. They can't wait for that process. So getting everything in place um, ahead of the disaster um, could help um, expedite that transition. Um, it also lets the homeowner remain in place until after a flood recurs. You're not trying to relocate people before you have to, um, and it's going to avoid sinking these taxpayer dollars into this flood rebuild repeat cycle. Um, Obviously, um, it wouldn't be economic to offer this sort of a program to all homes. Um, it would be most beneficial to offer this policy to homeowners that have properties valued at less than two hundred fifty thousand. Um, crunching some NRGCs crunched some numbers and found that those homes um, have a much uh, higher probability of having this. Uh, having the damages um, exceed the actual, and the repairs for these damages exceed the actual cost of the structure. Um, so you'd want to make this policy available um, to homes. We, you would target it to make it available to homes below that, below that threshold, um, for owners that are lower middle income, a place where you have the history of, these, of being at a high risk of flooding in communities that would be willing to help with the relocation, and that FEMA determines this is a cost-effective place where you'd be sinking uh, more dollars into repeated repairs than the buyout. And obviously, it's a very complicated and fraught question um, to have people relocate. Um, but there's been indications um, in surveys of homeowners that there's at least um, some sizable population of folks who would be willing to voluntarily relocate if they were offered the means to do so. Um, the second um, proposal that I'm going to talk about would be um, creating uh, more resilience enhancing substantial damage and improvement standards. So FEMA defines substantial damage um, to a structure as damage of any origin for which the cost of uh, repairing the structure is going to exceed 50% of the market value um, before the structure was damaged. Um, improvements. Um, function similarly, except instead of a repair, it's an improvement, same 50% threshold. Um, and the reason why these standards are um, significant is if your home is substantially dam damaged, then um, you could be triggered to come into compliance with um, floodplain regulations. Um, so in the special flood hazard areas, you could be triggered to have to elevate your home um, above base flood elevation, which is very expensive, but also you know, very important if we're trying to avoid this problem of repeatedly rebuilding the same properties. Um, so these damage standards um, could be enhanced um, if they were to calculate damages cumulatively. So instead of just having a 50% threshold, say you get damaged 25% one year and then 25% um, three years later, um, or 26% say you go over the 50% damage and then this would be um, triggered. So you're t making note of this repetitive loss. Um, also, the 50% threshold is fairly high. Um, a lower threshold would obviously um, force um, homes to come into compliance um, sooner. Um, 
the graphic I have up here is of homes in uh, Galveston, Texas, that were exposed to uh, five feet of flood waters, and the red homes were found to be substantially damaged, the green homes were not, and this kind of raises an issue of enforcement that happens on the ground. Um, it's difficult to tease out if really all those um, green homes were not substantially damaged if they were exposed to that same five feet of flood waters. There's definitely a high incentive to lowball the assessment of the damage. Um, if, because you don't want to saddle folks with these high costs, um, but if a cumulative damage standard would make it a little harder to have low balling, um, have folks um, avoid this trigger because you couldn't just say, up, oh, it's 45% damaged, you would have, you know, a second um, damaging event um, in a number of years, and that would bring it over um, the threshold. So, for communities that are interested in um, changing these standards, the community rating system um, operated under the NFIP um, does provide a discount on flood insurance premiums for communities that undertake more ambitious standards, um, including cumulative and lower threshold standards. Um, we were able to get some data from FEMA that's not publicly available um, that shows at least as of 2013 there are roughly 400 communities receiving um, credit for a cumulative damage standard, um, 25 for a lower threshold standard. Um, so obviously there's room for a lot more communities to follow suit. Um, states can help encourage the adoption of these more rigorous standards um, by making this language part of their model flood ordinances. Um, and an initial review of state model uh, flood ordinances found at least 12 states that mention these uh, higher standards as a second option, and seven states which mention them as the default to have these higher standards. Um, Um, this is some language which I'm not going to take the time to um, get into in detail um, right now, but just kind of showing how you might set up um, a 40% market value threshold um, and then might also add language in there for the model flood ordinance of saying, you know, perhaps during a 10-year period you would look at flood events that, um, having at least two flood events that equal or exceed 20% of the market value in damages. Um, and of course, um, I should touch on the fact that this is a very expensive um, process for homeowners to elevate their structure. Um, there is, of course, the benefit of these reduced premiums for um, communities that enter the program, as well as ICC, increased cost of compliance funding of up to $30,000 to help folks. It's still potentially not enough. Um, in a forthcoming paper, we talk a little bit about opportunities to use um, parametric insurance, um, insurance triggered based on the nature of an event, um, and uh, also catastrophe bonds by municipalities to maybe start financing um, some of these changes. But um, there's definitely um, financing issues and equity um, issues that need to be addressed um, if we're adopting these higher standards to make sure they're done um, fairly. And the uh, last um, solution I'm going to very briefly touch on would be um, uh, increasing the prevalence of state flood risk disclosure laws. Um, so laws that when you um, sell your home, you have to disclose the flood risk um, to the buyer, which um, I was surprised to find out, you might be surprised to find out, is not something that you necessarily have to do in most states. Um, so there's an interactive map up on NRDC's website that uh, shows some of the data we collected. Um, in regards to this, there are 21 states that lack statutory or regulatory requirements of any nature, from what we could tell, um, to disclose a property's history of flood damages or its location in the floodplain. Um, 29 states at least required at a minimum that sellers disclose that the property is located, located in a designated floodplain before the point of sale, but only 10 states had additional requirements. Requirements, um, to disclose whether there'd been any flood damages to structures on the property, which you know you, you have homeowners, may, home buyers making this um, really um, one of the most important financial decisions of their lives. And if you don't have the information out there, um, they can't make um, decisions to reduce their risk. So that information and transparency um, could be highly beneficial. Um, also, one thing that states could do in this space is to work on filling loopholes. Um, in New York, you basically just can pay $500, and then you don't have to meet your disclosure requirements in New York. Um, there <laughs> seems kind of fitting, right? Um, <laughs> There are also um, loopholes in many states in regard to foreclosures, so that's another way to kind of get out of disclosing. Um, and 
I think that's probably about as much time as I left myself to, to speak. Um, so um, I, could, I think we might have a few minutes for questions. Two, two questions. Awesome. But I'm around if people want to talk to me separately later. Thank you. So with regards to the substantial damage issue, did you examine all, at all how we could try to address the fact that that substantial damage threshold itself automatically brings up an equity issue because it's, a, it's triggered much more easily by a house that has a lower value than a higher value house? Yeah. Um, we definitely acknowledge that, and it's, it's definitely a problem. It's very hard to figure out what can be done about that other than, as I was saying, try to ensure that there's complementary um, policies in place to make sure that there's adequate financing um, for communities that um, are triggered by this standard. I don't know if, you, if you're looking for a more, a more detailed response, but. Anything you can give is, is appreciated. Nina, the National Flood Insurance Program, as I'm sure you know, is scheduled to run out of money and expire at the end of this year. Mm -hmm. uh, so it needs reauthorization, it needs funding. Uh, <clears throat> several bills, actually one large bill passed the Republican House last year, uh, not favored uh, by the Democratic Party. Uh, it would have privatized, it was, it was a mess. But um, to what extent do you think is possible, uh, I think a lot of people would like to get behind a national effort to positively change the flood insurance program. You mentioned a couple of ideas here. Right. That should change. Uh, is uh, your group or any other group you're aware of uh, promoting a particular, here's how you can make this program great again uh, idea for <laughs> flood insurance? Make it NFIP great again. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we're, as I mentioned, we're partnered with the Natural Resources Defense Council on this work, um, and we've been trying to develop uh, model legislation and to kind of try to, um, and NRDC particularly has been trying to work with their contacts to see how we can um, have pilot programs or work some of these other solutions into um, national legislation. Um, there's been some blogging by NRDC actually on trying to argue for some um, proposals as we're trying to reauthorize the program. So stay tuned, we're trying. <laughs> Just a quick note to add to that, Dennis. If you want some really good existing policy recommendations for NFIP, the Association for State Floodplain Managers has a really good website where they have detailed policy recommendations on NFIP and their suggestions for what should be included in NFIP reform. All right, so um, I can probably adjust this for me and our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is gonna discuss some of the infrastructure and sea level rise issues um, that local uh, governments are facing regarding maintenance. Thomas Rupert leads the Florida Sea Grant College Program's Coastal Planning Program. Through this program, Thomas, a licensed attorney, works with partners to develop legal and policy analysis for local governments on planning for sea level rise, community resilience, and associated long-term challenges and opportunities for Florida's coastal communities. Thomas. Thank you so very much, Julia. A great pleasure to be here, and I just really want to say thank you to Roger Williams School of Law and to the Rhode Island Sea Grant Program for putting on such a wonderful program, program today. And I saw a quick exodus there. I hope that's not because of me, so we'll find out. Oh, class, good. Then I have a, that makes me feel much better. So let's dive right in. Uh, uh, this is, you know, 
to comfort you. It looks like this is going to be easy, right? So just four quick points. You got some context. Then I want to look at infrastructure as legal liability and do a case study more in-depth on a case that Elena mentioned. And then look at something that I haven't heard anyone talk about very much, not only here, but generally, which is how are we going to clean things up when we lose areas? Um, before I start, I'm going to acknowledge that there is, who here feels like they got everything they could have out of Elena's pr legal presentation? Yeah, that's what I thought. This stuff is dense enough where you can hear the same thing over and over again, I've discovered, because I do a lot of work with local governments. And uh, so there's going to be tremendous overlap, so hopefully a little more of it will sink in the second time around. So with that, I'm going to set a little context here by first acknowledging everything you see here is representative of what so far local governments seem to be thinking about when they think about sea level rise. What do you do? Well, you do something infrastructure-based to try to protect from it. So here you've got an example on the far right. There's, there's a big duckbill valve to, pretend, to prevent ocean water from backing up into a drainage system to help it function better and keep from flooding neighborhoods. You've got in the lower left there, you've got a uh, stormwater injection pump down in Key West trying to deal with their stormwater problems. And then in the upper right, you've got my personal favorite. See how that taxi is sitting at a bit of an angle there? That's where the transition point is temporarily, where they're elevating roads in Miami Beach. A half billion dollars they're spending on ele elevating roads and installing pump systems in a small barrier island that's, I think, seven square miles. So half a billion dollars for a project that, yeah, even by their best estimates, most optimistic estimates, might last 20 years. So that leads me to what I simply start these present. You know, I used to start with the science and go over, you know, sea level rise and history and the projections. I don't bother with that anymore because most of the time now I'm trying to talk to local governments that accept enough of the science that we can get right to the heart of the policy matters. And I think one of the fundamental facts that I start with now is that we're not going to protect everything. Miami Beach is going to try, and they're going to succeed for a while probably. But again, who else as a local government can leverage half a billion dollars in the span of what? I think they raised that in about three years, four years maybe. Not many people, have, not many local governments have that sort of bonding authority. So we have to, as we lose places, it's something we haven't really usually done. So who shoulders those losses? Why and how are they going to do it? And of course, local governments are right in the middle of all of this challenge, and they've got conflicting interests. On the one hand, they clearly want to protect the health and safety of their constituents and try to avoid some risk. On the other hand, we can see that they also like to grow their tax base um, and grow. They want to avoid legal liability, and of course, there are lots of complications always with politics at the local level. If that weren't complicated enough, you know, as was noted, you've got these 12 little words in the Fifth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, uh, the protections of private property, and how this is interpreted has a great impact on what local governments do and are willing to do or not do. So there is some context for us. With that as context, let's jump into a first type of infrastructure I wanted to look at is drainage. So a colleague and I started asking the question, if you're a local government, you own a drainage system. And that drainage system either isn't working as well as it used to because of the increase in sea level rise, or it's actually literally allowing flooding because it's become the conduit by which the ocean backs up into neighborhoods, what is your potential liability as a local government for flooding damages that result? And when we started this, one of the interesting things that we discovered, and that I think most people don't realize, is at least in Florida, there's no obligation on the part of local government to provide drainage. And I would bet that's probably true in most of the states here in New England as well. There's not an outright obligation to do that. But of course, since no good deed goes unpunished, 
once you have started to provide drainage, you now have that legal liability that Elena mentioned that you now have to do reasonable maintenance on that to make sure that nobody suffers harm from your lack of maintenance. And while you have a legal liability for that maintenance, you don't, uh, you don't have a legal liability that forces you to upgrade infrastructure. And so you might ask, well, why, why is that? Well, I think it's pretty clear from a policy perspective, if you've already got an infrastructure system in place to do drainage for a neighborhood, people have probably come in there, they've built there, they depend on that infrastructure to be operating. But of course, you can't move into an area and then, ex and then demand that the local government upgrade that infrastructure. You moved in without it there. Why do you expect them to not, the local government to now have to provide it? Part of the reason also goes to something that was kind of mentioned, I think, briefly in Elena's, but I want to focus even more on, which is the idea of separation of powers. So if you go back, what was it, maybe eighth grade civics class or something, maybe earlier, where you learned about the fact that, well, we separate our government into three co-equal branches, the legislative, judicial, and executive. And we don't want to allow any one of those parts of government to exercise the authority of the other parts because that's one of our checks on governmental power. And so what we get into is this idea that maintenance is just this kind of average thing that not only do local governments have to do to protect people, but it's something that even all of us have to comply with. So if you have a house and your front step is wooden and rotted out and I come and visit you and step on that step and it breaks and I break my leg, you're liable. You didn't do the proper maintenance and it harmed me. So this is not an unusual, this isn't limited to local governments. So courts have no problem saying, local government, you didn't do kind of this basic maintenance to protect people, and now you're liable for harm that resulted from that. An upgrade is completely different because when a local government makes a decision to upgrade or not to upgrade, that local government is now exercising its discretionary authority to make a legislative policy decision. That's not something that they mandatorily have to do. It's discretionary. And that is the quintessential core of the legislative duty and the legislative branch of government is to make hard policy decisions that balance competing interests. So courts give a really great amount of latitude to legislative decision making because the courts understand if we second guess them on every legislative decision, we're actually putting ourselves as the judicial branch in the shoes of the legislative branch. That's inappropriate. So that's why the separation of uh, powers function is so, uh, our doctrine is so important. Um, so then that relates back to this idea of immunity that Elena discussed in some detail. So local governments, again, you don't have, Im you have, Im you don't have immunity for the ministerial simple functions that we all have to do, but you do tend to have immunity for these discretionary planning level decisions. So, another type of infrastructure. Somebody spent an awful lot of money here, or is in the process of spending an awful lot of money on this fancy new seawall. How does it look like it's working? <laughs> you know, there are a couple of interesting things about seawalls that make them an unusual type of infrastructure. The first is just, as you can see here, if it abuts to another seawall that isn't as high, it doesn't turn out to be worth very much in a high tide event, as you can see here. <laughs> And the second thing is, is it's probably one of the most common forms of infrastructure where you're gonna have a budding private and publicly owned. So it's kind of unusual that way as well. So how do you address those situations where a low seawall might allow flooding in an entire neighborhood and maybe either publicly or privately owned? Well, the city of Miami Beach, as they're dealing with this problem, they simply did some analysis of different projections of sea level rise and heights, and they set a new minimum for seawalls. So if you go in for a permit to rebuild, for a substantial rebuild or a new seawall, you have to build to a new minimum height. But that doesn't really address existing seawalls that are causing problems. So Fort Lauderdale down in Florida took a really creative approach. At first, they were gonna do just what Fort Lauderdale did, but they were gonna put a certain time by which you had to bring your seawall into compliance if it was a private seawall. And of course, 
community got pretty upset about this. And to its credit, the city did a great job of really reaching out and talking with property owners about the issue and came up with a very, very creative solution that I think is one of the best I've seen so far. They actually say that now they passed an ordinance where you can be cited for a code violation as a property owner if you allow salt water to flow off of your property and flood public or private property. So think about that. I mean, if I own property and, it, and seawater flows over it and floods you, I'm gonna be, I can be cited by the city for a code violation. Now it's my responsibility to fix this. So they give 365 days uh, for you to fix that. And I think it's uh, six months to prove that you're making, or maybe it's 180, yeah, I think it was six months, to uh, demonstrate that you're taking some action towards curing this code violation. And so it has the great benefit of really focusing money and energy on only those seawalls that are actually causing problems right now for neighborhoods. So here is just a memorandum that the city sent out to the, uh, or the, to the city manager about this new ordinance and how they're complying with it. And so far, compliance has been pretty good, and they've had good luck with it. And again, that's based in large part not on the fact that it doesn't cause hardship for people and isn't expensive and a challenge, but because of the amount of outreach and out, uh, education that they have done with their community members to help them understand why are we doing this to you? Because the options were worse. So now let's go into a specific case study with roads. And this is the case that Elena mentioned. And now this, actually, you can see in this picture, this is what, just up until a couple of years ago, was actually the best section of a 1.6 mile piece of what used to be Florida State Highway A1A. Do I have a pointer? Nope, apparently not. Let me see if I can. Ah, we've got a mouse though. So what you can see right here is you can see this is current Florida State Highway A1A right here. But this is a realignment. Previously it was built right out here. So it was built on this little treeless spit of sand in between the Atlantic here and the Summer Haven River right here. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly, it is pretty laughable. Yeah, well, and you know, Florida Department of Transportation, it built most of this segment as late as the 50s. And I think they kind of started laughing or crying at themselves because by about less than 10 years after they built that section of road, they realized, you know, that was just really stupid. Um, we're not even gonna try to fight this battle, they said. And they simply bought new right of way and relocated it to its current configuration at least 1.6 miles, this particular 1.6 miles. At that time, that 1.6 miles of road had three, count them, three homes on it. That'll become relevant. But before we do the, go any further, let's just take a look at a couple pictures. So this was 2007. Now, if you look care, oh, I didn't want to do that yet. If you look carefully, you can see what's happening. What's happening right there, there, and there. Yeah, a little bit of overwash right over the beach. So there used to be some homes right down here that are now no longer there. They've been destroyed. Uh, but this is 2007, a little beginnings of overwash. There's 2010. I mean, the river is gone. There's the river. Now it's gone. Made for some great pictures, but I guess I didn't throw them in this one. I've got a great picture of an... Uh, an aquaculture lease stuck in the sand, you know, it's terrible. So here's one of the homes that is along what used to be the road. So the road would have been right here, and this is what they used to have for potable water supply. That was under the road, so that's where the road should have been. And I, my back was to the water as I'm taking this picture. So this was this home, I probably took it in about 2013 maybe or so. There's that same home after Hurricane uh, Matthew in 2016. So you can see it had some small dune left, just nothing after Matthew. Oh, and well, 
then we had or then we had Matthew in 2017, so two years in a row it got nailed. And here you can see it's just frequent overwash, completely over that part of this little spit of sand. So of course this house, you know, one of the things I did is took pictures of all the uh, broken four-inch PVC lines. You all know what that's for coming out of that house. Well, these houses were all in septic, by the way. Did I mention that septic? Let's see, we're about how far above water level in pure sand? Boy, yeah, permitting decisions. So again, there is what used to be the best part of that road prior to, I think this was after, yeah, this was after Matthew. And you can see the little chunks of asphalt there. That's, again, what's left of the road. And literally, every single property owner there, to get to that property, you have to have a four-wheel drive. You will not get anywhere in a two-wheel drive there. So, I mean, I talked to property owners. They were in brand new Jeeps. You know, this is how we get to our property now. So, of course, uh, property owners haven't been too happy about the degrading road, far even long before Irma and Matthew. So back in 2009, property, a bunch of the property owners got together and they sued the county. Because they said, hey, county, you're not doing enough maintenance on this road. And, you know, there are parts of the road washed away even before hurricanes on um, Matthew and Irma. So the county actually had to respond to that lawsuit. At the trial court, the county won very easily because the county said, look court, this is just our legislative decision. It's a discretionary decision that we're making on how much we spend on this road. Anybody care to guess on a five, in one five year period how much more per mile per year the county expended on this piece of road as opposed to a typical county road? 25 times as much per mile per year. So they were spending almost $250,000 a year on average for over this five year period on this section versus under 10,000 on their average county road mile. So the county was spending a tremendous amount of money trying to do something, but they were fighting the Atlantic. I mean, that's a, that's a losing battle every time. Property owners, of course, weren't happy that the they wanted, the city wanted, the county, excuse me, wanted the trial court level, so they appealed to Florida's 5th District Court of Appeals. And the 5th District Court of Appeals said, yes, city or county, you do have a tremendous amount of discretion how you spend your road maintenance funds, but you do have to do reasonable maintenance that results in meaningful access. So, reasonable maintenance sounds okay, right? We've already talked about that's a duty. But now they added a substantive standard, meaningful access. When you look at this picture, and again, this was even prior to Irma and Matthew, and it's you that has the local government, and you're on that commission, what are you gonna say? There was an estimate as far back as about 2006, long before things had gotten as bad as they are now, that it would have taken over $13 million for a beach nourishment project to even create enough dry land to have a place to try to build a roadbed. And you're talking less than two dozen homes. Uh, to put that in a little bit of perspective, well, so it would have been over $13 million up front cost plus an average of yeah, one to two million a year in maintenance costs for, you know, like I said, a little over a dozen homes. And to put that in perspective, the entire county's budget for road and bridge maintenance for the year 2009 was, let's see, it was $9.6 million. Oh, and that's for 1,027 miles of road and 47 bridges. And this is 1.6 miles. So you got two tenths of 1% of your road mileage consuming more than your entire budget for one year, and then a significant portion thereafter. Does that sound like kind of your average ministerial duty that if you're on the commission, you're gonna think your staff ought to be making those decisions? I don't think so. So, I mean, to me, that really brings in, and this is such a strange result to me. I just couldn't understand how can the court make that decision for the local government? And so I kind of start, after reading the case innumerable times, it kind of dawned on me there, they're using this word maintenance in a couple of different ways. Because again, if we go back to this picture, obviously there's, there's no road there to maintain. You can't do that. 
So it just reinforces what Elena brought up, and I've kind of started going into already, this distinction between what is maintenance versus discretionary planning. So maintenance, again, you patch it, you maybe repave it, um, but large-scale change and upgrading, that's discretionary. And when the court was talking in that case and using the word maintenance, what the court did was sometimes they used it as this legal term of art that, I, that we've been discussing, where it means this ministerial function. And other times they're talking about maintenance as you and I might in regular everyday conversation. Well, yeah, you didn't maintain a road there because it's gone. I can see you didn't maintain it there. But that's different. So they were using it kind of interchangeably, and I think that's part of what led to uh, a really poor reasoning for their case there. And so this separate, we come back again to that idea of separation of powers. And I argue, I uh, brought a copy of it here, if you want the full legal analysis of this, probably not for you unless you're a lawyer, but if you want to give it to your lawyer, um, it'll go through this much more carefully. But again, this idea of separation of powers, I would argue that that court is on the verge of really replacing its judgment for that of the local government. And that, I think, is the, one of the crucial mistakes that that court made in this case. And also, when we really look at it, if we start looking back to the Fifth Amendment and private property protections in our Constitution, they don't create a legal duty for government to protect private property from anything other than the government itself. And I would argue that what, the, what these property owners effectively managed to do in this case is they took that shield provided by the Fifth Amendment against arbitrary government action, and they, they reforged that shield into a sword that they're now using against the local government. And it brings me back to, I think, your comment earlier, sir, about equity issues. One of the things I discuss in the full article about this is the real equity implications of a case like this. Because <laughs> the trial court even noted very carefully that these are educated property owners. They were doctors and lawyers and college professors. I mean, these people didn't accidentally end up there without knowing what was going on. There was 30, 40, 50 years of very clear evidence on the disappearing ground of what was going on with this road. And yet they chose to purchase there. And oh, by the way, they got a lot better deal than any other coastal property because the road was either gone or in very poor condition. So they all buy there, build there, and then turn around and sue a, a local government that has 200,000 people total. Even after the local government has expended inordinate sums of money to try to help them, they still turn around and sue them. The county was left with a legal bill of over a million dollars. And again, this is a county of 200,000 people. It's largely rural. So, I mean, the inequity issues there, I, I would argue, are rampant. So, yes, then... So the case law, unfortunately, that case law is now binding law precedent for every trial court in the state of Florida. I didn't even mention another problem that I discuss at great length in this article, which is that that case, and Elena mentioned this, introduced completely new law into Florida that said that you could base a takings claim on government inaction. And I would argue that actually government inaction as a basis for a takings claim, there are a very small number of cases that have allowed it, but it's actually really small. And I, I would not characterize it as generally states allow that. Um, one of the things you mentioned, Elena mentioned Minnesota. One of the things I did in this article is I actually went very carefully back through all the Minnesota cases that were used to justify inaction. And what you realize is the emperor is wearing no clothes. There was abs you know, basically one court just simply added the word inaction for no apparent reason to their case law to a case. And then subsequent courts said, oh, look, it uses the word inaction. See, we can base this on inaction. And that case then kind of metastasized. And then they used that case in here. And now this case with the road in Jordan actually has been cited in the Maryland case that uh, Elena mentioned. So it's really, really important, I think, to very carefully examine 
the case law that courts use, especially when the decision they come to seems to be very odd. And in this case, what again, what I discovered is, if you do really careful analysis of the case law, it was extremely poorly reasoned. So even though that's the case law in Florida, we've got this new federal case, and uh, Elena probably explained this enough, I'll just touch on it, but the St. Bernard Parish, again, this is the one that resulted from the flooding after Katrina and where the property owners argued that it was the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers lack of maintenance on the Mississippi River Gulf outlet or Mr. Go that caused the flooding. So what was interesting is that since the complaint really focused on this harm from maintenance, this court said, well, oh, wait a minute, if you're talking maintenance, that's not, necess that's not a takings claim. Typically, if you're talking maintenance, that's standard of care, that is a tort or negligence claim, not a takings claim. Um, and so they simply said, you know, two things. One, file it in tort, which of course they already had, but had lost, that's why they tried to reframe it as a takings claim. Um, so that ended the case, but they also made very, very clear in that case, I think as Elena pointed out, that inaction is not a basis for arguing that the government is taking your property. Government only takes your property when they take it. Take is not a, pa not a passive thing, it's an active thing, and they argue that you need government action to cause a taking. Okay, so lots and lots of problems, right? So what do you do about it? Um, road design. Well, let's start with what the Florida Keys is doing because, of course, now there is a canary in the coal mine if you've ever seen one. Uh, it, they call it, they call the road in an, uh, they say it's, what is they say, the, long, the world's longest extension cord and garden hose because basically all their electricity and services come from the mainland. And you've got a county that's over 100 miles long and sometimes, you know, as narrow as the road that goes out there. So what the Florida Keys is trying to do is they're trying to assess, well, what can we provide for a level of service on our roads? And so far what they've done is they adopted kind of an interim measure based on an early pilot study, and they have said, well, anytime we're gonna do work on a road, we're gonna try to determine what's the useful lifespan of the work that we're trying to do now. So let's say they're doing a repaving, estimating maybe 20 years, life, 20 year lifespan for this repaving project on the road. So they're gonna look out 20 years on the climate, on the sea level rise projections they're using. And based on that sea level elevation that they expect within tw 20 years down the road, they're gonna set a level of service standard where they wanna elevate the road to the point where they estimate no more than seven days of flooding per year at the end of the lifespan of that road. Initially, the county was saying, well, we want zero days of flooding. And of course, the numbers very quickly indicated you're crazy because of the cost of that. And I don't have the cost breakdowns incorporated here, but if you'd like that, I can get you the report that has it. Uh, so then they elevate to that level. But still, one of the weaknesses of this is they don't know what's gonna cost yet, and they don't, are they committing themselves to a level of service that they may not be able to maintain? So, Based on, the, based on an ordinance passed by the local government in that road case that I discussed, I took a mo an ordinance they had developed in, re in response to that case and modified it some and created this Florida Sea Grant Model Roads Ordinance. And rather than looking at level of service based upon how many flooding days the road might be expected to experience, I actually looked at a financial threshold. So, you know, we're thinking of, we're used to thinking of level of service as an engineering idea. Here it would actually be financial. So it creates exceptions to LOS, that's level of service, for environmentally compromised road segments. And then if you do declare a segment of road based on specific criteria as environmentally compromised, now kick in these financial limitations on what the local government would be required or able under its own ordinances to spend on maintenance of that road segment. If this happens, then you have to add signage to the road, and that goes into some detail. I added that in because of some detail in tort law that we don't need to go into. And then if, the, if that work still doesn't result in meaningful access, then you could actually have the local government assisting with negotiation among property owners for access. 
MSBU, Municipal Services Benefit Unit, or a special, uh, special assessment. So that creates an option for the actual affected property owners to put in to advocate to the local government that they will actually self-impose assessments to generate additional funding for road maintenance. And finally, it goes over some of the abandonment procedures. A little flow chart of that actual uh, ordinance. Another thing local governments can do, I think, and this was also mentioned earlier, uh, focus heavily on creating policies within your capital improvement plan that really focus on the longer term future. And why do you want to do this? Because that's a clear exercise of your legislative authority. And what you're really trying to do to the courts is say, yes, this is us exercising our legislative authority. Uh, that is the core of what we need to do to make these difficult decisions. Please don't interfere with it. If there's never a guarantee a court won't, but this can help. And I think when you do that, you know, make, try to be very clear on integrating those limits on infrastructure expansion. Um, also, I guess I forgot to mention, careful ever accepting things for free. That local government in the Rhodes case there, that was, I forgot to mention, that was their first mistake. They accepted that road right of way from the state of Florida. They should have said, no way, we're not taking it. They never would have found themselves in this mess. So if somebody's putting in development, and they want to dedicate roads or infrastructure to you as a local government, be very careful. Again, no good deed goes unpunished. Just keep that in mind. Uh, how many people here have, uh, I want to see a show of hands. How many people are here have a lot of confidence that we as a society are going to be able to, avoid, to make the really hard policy decisions that avoid sea level rise becoming kind of this long, slow crisis punctuated by big disasters? Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. I thought there might be a couple of optimists here, but I guess not realists. Uh, yeah, I, I tend to be in the same camp with you. That's why I started thinking about, well, what is our future coastline going to look like? So maybe a bunch of you have heard jokes. I've made them too about, you know, yeah, I'm going to buy a few blocks inland and I can't wait till that's coastal property. Get it for a steal now. But think carefully about what that coastline is going to look like as it moves inland. And is this what it's going to look like? I guess the image that I have is, think about the problems that Detroit was having with abandoned buildings. And now think about that in a saltwater context. Um, debris, you know, illegal activities, squatters. I, I, is anybody, who wants to live next to that? Imagine the water quality impacts. Because if somebody's gonna walk away from their house because it's now literally rather than figuratively underwater, do you really think they're gonna say, oh gosh, I best, guess I better clean this up before I leave? I mean, if the property doesn't have value and they're walking away from it because of that, you as a local government have no leverage anymore. It's gone. Your leverage with property owners is always what? It's a lien. You can actually put, use a legal tool to get at the value of that property if you need to do something. But not when the property doesn't have any value. So how are you gonna, you're gonna be left holding this bag. What are you gonna do about that? General tax funds, does that sound like a good idea? Are you going to have enough of those by the time this is already occurring? Let's see, by this time, you've probably already spent really, really heavily on massive infrastructure that is no longer working in this scenario because, of course, you were pressured politically to do so. And your revenues are probably declining. And now you're saddled with this. So a couple of possible ideas I started thinking about. Who here is familiar with surety bonds or just bonds? Yeah, not too many. So it's a tool that's actually pretty commonly used by government. Um, what you've got is you've got, say, the property owner, the principal I listed them as here, and it's a three-way contract between the property or the property owner, the local government, and a surety company. And essentially what happens is, is the property owner goes to the surety company with a con and gets a contract and pays them for a contract where the surety company says to the local government, I'll make sure that what that property owner is supposed to do under your ordinance will happen. I'm going to make sure of it. The property owner's paid me. I'm telling you, I'm giving you my guarantee it's going to happen. And the local government will accept that then. And it's important to note, this isn't insurance. If the, if the surety company needs to go back and clean up that property because that property owner walked away, 
the surety company's still going to want to sue that property owner and get their money for everything they expended to do the cleanup. It's not insurance. It's just a guarantee that something's going to happen that you have to pay for. So that kind of really, I think, is the great weakness of it, actually, is that it's contract directly with a property owner. Well, if I'm a surety company, you know, it's, it's already commonly used in these kind of contexts. But, you know, when you think of mine reclamation, that's a massive, probably multinational company, extensive resources. If I'm a surety company, I'm pretty darn confident that if this isn't their only mine, they've got big operations around the world, they're going to have financial assets I can go after if they don't do what they're supposed to do. That's my guarantee that I'm going to be able to sue them and get my money. But if you're an individual property owner who owns a house on the beach that's not worth anything, how do I know that you're going to have the assets to pay me back? So this is probably not a viable model except for maybe on some commercial properties owned by massive companies. Um, so you know, even if you do try to use it in that, there are some things to consider. I think a more interesting concept, and now this I will tell you, I don't know that this is ready for prime time. I haven't really done sufficient legal analysis on this yet, but the idea being, uh, assess those properties ahead of time. I mean, the analogy is a special, a special assessment. And what you do is you estimate, what is, the, what is the cleanup cost to me as the local government for this property when it's abandoned? And then you amortize that out over a certain number of years. And then you start assessing the property for that so that you've created a fund that you now have access to to pay for that specifically for that property cleanup. Yeah, there is administrative cost to that and it would be complex, um, but I think it's one of the few options that I've been able to think of for creating a revenue stream dedicated specifically to this need for cleanup. One of the big questions that needs to be addressed from a legal perspective is if special benefits assessment is the model for this, how are you going to characterize the special benefit to that property of, pr of prospectively assessing it for its ultimate demise and destruction? That's going to take some creative lawyering, I think. And, the question, and then there's a further question is, if you're in a home rule state where you have broad plenary authority to administer government, do you even need to call it a special assessment or can you simply do this under your home rule authority? So maybe you don't even need to argue a special benefit there. I think I'm getting low on time here, so I want to just uh, jump ahead a little bit. Um, this, I think, is important because it's been touched on, but I want to hit it again. Ultimately, you need to engage very, very deeply and intimately with your community. I, I don't care how many legal solutions we get solutions we give you, or that you develop, or that anybody develops. They're going to be costly and they're going to be difficult decisions. And there's never going to be political will without people understanding, like in Fort Lauderdale, why are you doing this to me? And I just can't emphasize that, that point enough. And of course, some obvious points there that you can go over as well. I want to just touch before we stop on notice. And this was mentioned in the flood insurance context, but I would argue that we should be talking about it much, much more broadly. So notice or providing property purchasers with advance notice of some of the risks and hazards that they can anticipate in say purchasing a coastal property, I think is absolutely critical because coming from Florida, we you know, you see the people, they're coming from Ohio or Iowa or goodness knows where. Uh, they don't have a real great idea about coastal dynamics. They see a property, they see the beach, they, you know, this is their retirement dream. And like, there are all these other houses on the beach. It must be fine, right? And they're not used to moving property boundaries. If you had cornfields in Ohio, they didn't usually move around on you very often. So you get people that just don't understand this. And making sure that they do can actually potentially have some legal implications. And I'm not going to go into depth on this because some of you may not be attorneys and it would just bore you and maybe confuse you. But there is this potential for that to have implications in a court's analysis of whether or not a government regulation is a taking of private property through inverse condemnation, as Elena discussed. So I kind of naively thought 
since there's no potential takings claim associated with providing notice to potential property purchasers, I naively thought when I started this job several years ago, that'd be a great place to start because you can do this and nobody's gonna successfully sue you for doing it. And that's true, that, that is absolutely true. I will stand by that one. But I had no idea the politics. So here's an actual marker. That is on the embankment of US I-10 in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. And that's just a commemorative marker. You, yeah, right above here, right there, if you can just make it out, it's actually kind of a wavy line. That's the high water line from Hurricane Katrina. This again is the overpass over I-10, so you can see the water came up to the bottom of the overpass. And this is over three miles from the nearest body of water. So pretty amazing. And the Federal Department of Transportation put that marker there after Katrina. What do you think Bay St. Louis officials thought about that marker? <laughs> I, there was a great interview, radio interview I have a recording of where the mayor at the time said, look, this is some of the most valuable vacant, vacant land along the entire I-10 corridor in the state of Mississippi. And you're devaluing it with that marker there. And they argued so vehemently with Federal Department of Transportation over this that this was the result. Yeah, uh, unbelievable. Uh, that, I took that picture just a couple years later. So notice, we know how to do it and we can do it well, but we don't. And that is entirely a political, not a legal question. So I'm a strong supporter of work towards making that politically viable. I live in a state where most of the state is run by, wait for it if you don't know already, developers and real estate agents. I mean, that's, that's what Florida is all about. It's about development. So it's really hard there. Maybe some of you in states that are less controlled by those interests will have better luck. Here are some of the references to a few of the resources that will give much more detailed information than I could go through today. Maybe a little humor if you, if you can find this still funny. You know, I don't know about that little piggy, but with that I'll end and say thank you very much for your time and hopefully we have a little bit of time for questions. Tom, that was great. Thank you. I, I want to take you to the Gulf Coast uh, panhandle community that was, as I understand it, pretty much wiped clean about five blocks uh, in... Was it Mexico City Beach? Yes. Yeah. Um, it strikes me that this is a great opportunity um, to use this as a, as a model uh, for the rest of the state. Um, our, our discussion uh, on, on takings issue was always that, uh, of course, we must pay just compensation if the government wants property. Um, I would offer that a, uh, uh, a small lot uh, that is probably substandard for that zoning in that community uh, now uh, uh, that has had the road wiped away, has had the power service wiped away, the sewage system doesn't work. Um, it's perhaps not valueless, but it could only be valued as an open eighth of an acre of beach. And now beach property does have have value on its own, but certainly not the value it would have as a site for a single family dwelling. Um, in the oral arguments for the Lucas case, when the attorney for, for, for Mr. Lucas said, my property has been denied all the value of my property, little Justice Blackman ra raised up his hand and said, excuse me, could I, then, could I see you after the hearing today and buy it for a dollar? making fun of the argument that just because a property's value has been lowered because of storm action, it really is value less. So what about the potential hypothetical situation of the community saying, um, we think that this would be, this entire area would remain, could become a wonderful new beach, uh, but we're gonna have to clear out the remains of these foundations and we're going to try and on maybe on the other side of the coastal highway, um, try to make some land available for people to rebuild in a different location. Thoughts? Yeah, definitely thoughts. Uh, part of me would really love to agree with you on that and say, absolutely, offer them, you know, instead of the 800,000 that property would have cost, market value is 10,000 now. 
However, uh, again, take you back to my naive days of having started this job, I went out to Pensacola, which I forget now which hurricane it even was, because it was a number of years ago, and uh, I think maybe Ivan, and there was a seven-story condo building, and it was slab on grade on the sand near the beach, and with the surge with Hurricane Ivan, part of the foundation was undermined, and you had this seven-story condo building with cracks running top to bottom and parts of it leaning. And so I called the property appraiser's office, because this had been a number of years earlier. And I said, so, you know, government, I was naively assuming they must have lost some real tax revenue off of this, right? Because nothing's been rebuilt. And that was condemned. So I called the property appraiser's office looking for data, Oh no, significantly higher value after that damage. <laughs> Who runs the state of Florida and what does it live on? It runs on development. Why? Because that was an old condo building. It was, I think, built maybe in the 70s. So, I mean, you've got maybe 12, 1,500 square feet, maybe, maybe two baths. People don't want that nowadays when they're buying on the beach and the panhandle. They want, you know, 2,800 square feet and three or four bathrooms. So it was actually, it's redevelopment. That's what hurricanes really are about in Florida. It's redevelopment. <laughs> this is a developer's dream. I mean, that's the mentality. So I want to agree with you, but that's not what my experience tells me is going to happen. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm here to cheer you up. How's, how am I doing? <laughs> Well, like I said, that's Florida, and we all know it's full of wackos down there. So I, again, I'm not saying that you can't do better up here, but. I have a question about the road ordinance solution, and that is, have you thought about how utilities, or particularly private utilities, would play into the abandonment of roads? And any advice on that? No, I haven't thought about that carefully, but actually, if somebody's willing to do some real challenging nitty gritty research, that same case with the road, Actually, when I showed you the one picture I commented on the water line that was there, that was actually a section, that was privately provided system that ran underneath that public easement. So I don't know the background story of what actually happened when that system was compromised to the point where the private provider decided they weren't gonna to try to fix it. I don't know anything personally about what would be any potential legal issues involved there. So unfortunately, no, I, I haven't considered that and I can't help you on that point. This, this is a Florida question because it's hard to understand Florida. Um, if you could, I'd worry. I have a colleague at Brown, and she's been looking at um, attitudes about value of coastal property and how people, even though all of this is coming, they continue to value the property and the, and the appreciation is still there. And there's something back there, must be in the back of the mind, that somebody's going to bail me out, i.e. the case you just showed. But when it becomes clear that this can't be sustained, um, and, and this, do you see a bubble here? I mean, is there... I mean, this could be the bubble of all bubbles. Um, and there are people who study bubbles and would suggest we may be looking at that. And then what is the politics of all that? Florida will be the front line. So just a question whether there's this dread in the system when this all comes crashing home. Maybe 10 years from now when the curve turns up and the rise starts to really accelerate. If you can figure that out, Talk to me privately, I, 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 I will find money, we'll make a billions if you can figure that. Nobody knows when and why the system is gonna crash. We all have a lot of ideas and theories because the real estate value in the coastal properties in Florida is a lot like the stock market. I mean, you kind of implicit in your question, it's based on perception. So you've got a lot of local governments in Florida, again, because of development and real estate, that are absolutely paranoid about the fact that people are going to really understand the scope of this, they're scared of that. Because then you change the perception and suddenly 
you wonder, was it all just a house of cards and does it come crashing down around you? And again, at some point, I'm, I'm, I'm completely convinced it's going to. I just can't tell you how, what's going to be the trigger, nor can I tell you when. I mean, is the trigger going to be lack of availability of insurance, driving it entirely to a cash market, which of course causes massive social displacement and back to the equity issues? Is it going to be another massive storm that finally the storm, the massive storm and damage that breaks the camel's back because the federal government just can't do it this time? I, I don't, is it gonna be that the bond market for local governments dries up because nobody has any faith that they're gonna be able to pay back these billions of dollars they're trying to borrow for infrastructure that's only gonna buy them a little bit of time at best. You know, I, I can give you a long list of possible triggers, but as soon as one of them hits, I'm pretty convinced it's all gonna happen fairly quickly. Yeah. Because it's all based on the perceptions and the property values and the revenues generated there. So as soon as one thing comes and you crack that wall, I think it's gonna happen. I don't think it's gonna be a nice graceful slide. It's a Ponzi scheme. Yes. So I know you mentioned Fort Lauderdale um, and just in general these cash-strapped local governments. Do you, I know I saw a news article recently about um, an organization talking about or talking to Fort Lauderdale and they're considering suing like fossil fuel companies. And I know there's a number of different lawsuits, different types all around the country now around that. Do you see that as a viable, you know? part of a solution to just help like local governments have some money to deal with some of these issues? You know, I'm actually not the best person to ask that, I think, here today. I think I would probably actually defer some of my colleagues this morning and encourage you to ask them that privately. Um, usually when I do these kind of presentations in Florida, I've got a great friend and colleague that I do it with, and she focuses very much on that, and she excuse me, probably enjoy your question, but I just don't feel that I have, I think there are others here that will provide better insights than I will. One more question, if there's one more. Yeah, sorry to disappoint you, but I just prefer to defer to them. Um, you brought up the uh, municipal bond markets, and I was wondering if, if you or... Um, Maybe somebody had looked at uh, the ratings for bonds in coastal communities and whether they reflect the risks that you described. I have not personally done any research to quantify this. I haven't even really done it qualitatively, but I can tell you two little things. First, oh, how many years now? Probably about three years ago, I'm guessing, maybe more. Uh, it was Moody's that sent a letter to a number of local governments in, was it uh, Virginia Beach, that's where it was, around Virginia Beach area, asking them what they planned to do about flooding and sea level rise. Because Moody's wanted to know because they needed to rate their bonds and of course the basis of the guarantee for the bonds is the property tax revenue, which means Moody's cares about their continued viability of their property tax value. So they had this like several pages of questions for these local governments about how are you planning to do this to protect that property value so that we know that you can pay back your bonds and that when we give you, you know, whatever rating that we're we have the good information to justify that rating. That's one. The second one is, I think it was maybe last year, where I'll tell you, Miami Beach was so happy that they were advertising how they just got a, uh, what was it, like a 4A rating on their bonds. Maybe it's 3A, I forget which is the highest rating. And they were so proud of that because they're like, see, this is what all our resilience planning is doing, is it's keeping our bond ratings high. because. They, I would argue, are the absolute epitome of the Ponzi scheme. I mean, I've, I'm not, you didn't hear me say that, and I'm not in Florida, so I think I'm okay. Uh, oh, there's a recording. Uh, no, I mean, their whole strategy is we have a lot of property value to protect. Pretty clear. How do we protect it? Well, we spend a lot of money. And how do we generate that money? Well, let's 
just keep increasing the density of development, the property value, ta the tax base, so that we can afford to spend more and more and more money. That's the idea. I mean, it's pretty clear. I don't think I'm making that up. I think anybody that looks at it will see that. And, you know, how long is that viable? Again, I don't know. And I don't, and I'm not even, and I guess I should caveat, I'm not even saying that's the worst thing they could be doing. Because maybe that's what they should do. I don't know. Maybe that's what people there really want. I would argue that the biggest challenge to that is that if there's something that we should have learned from floodplain management all these years and we haven't, it's that whenever you start to, de to depend upon structural protection, what you ultimately do in the long term, I would argue, is you increase the amount of actual vulnerability in the long term. And all those projections, or all these statistics that have been given today about the value of climate disasters and natural disasters, if you go back to some IPCC research, I think all that needs to be caveat. I'm not saying that dis I'm not saying the natural disasters aren't becoming more powerful or frequent, but in those statistics, the IPCC a few years back actually said, look, most of that increase isn't due to the changing climate yet. It's just due to the fact that we're doing more and more expensive and expensive, de uh, more and more development in these hazardous places. So even if we had the exact same amount of natural disasters happening, we're gonna see a huge increase in the cost of them. So, and I, I don't want that to be left out when we talk, when we focus on climate change and sea level rise. Because if there's something that drives me crazy, we love to talk in Florida about how we build, but we, it's, it's, it is the sacred cow that you do not talk about where we build. So we are um, gonna break now. We have lunch um, outside to the right. You'll see it right, right near registration. Um, there are several locations that you can bring your lunch to so you can sit with colleagues um, at various sized tables. Um, you'll see some tables immediately behind us. Um, they'll point you to them at the registration desk. There's also the Bay View room, which is all the way down. It's a glassed in room. You'll also get pointed in that direction. Um, and then room 256, which is directly across from here is also available for sitting for having your lunch. Please be back here at two o'clock. We'll see you then.